Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. So let's talk about speaker directivity, and in particular, how it affects treatment, because I got a question from one of my email subscribers asking about this, and I think it's a wonderful question. Let me just quickly read it to you. Hey, Jesko, not sure if you've answered this one before, but how does the directivity pattern of a speaker affect acoustic treatment of a room? Does a controlled, narrow directivity have a different set of requirements from a broad, not as controlled one? How about cardioid mid-bass? David. Good question, David. So yeah, that's what I want to get into today because this is a really, really interesting question. It raises one of my fundamental kind of pet peeves with speaker directivity. Uh, so I'm going to get into that. But before I do that, I want to help you out treating your room. If you're in the process, if you're thinking about it, if you're wondering what the next step for you needs to be, or you're just facing a particular problem and you don't know how to solve it, then I want you to download my home studio treatment framework at the link in the description. These are my five steps to treating a room and getting it to translate. And it's all in there in the right order. And that's the important bit, right? So what steps do you need to take in order to go from an untreated room, just starting out with an empty room, setting up your speakers, finding your listening position, planning the treatment, speaker decoupling, subwoofers, measurements, it's all in there in the right order and with what you need to focus on in particular with each of these steps so that you really get the most out of it and you don't end up turning in circles. Yeah. So if you're in the process of treating your studio and you're wondering what the next step, step needs to be, then you can check this out and find out where you are in the process and what you need to do next. Or if you're finding that you have a particular problem. If you then go through these steps, you might find that you missed something or you didn't do it right with the focus on the wrong thing. And so that's what you need to focus your energy on before you can actually move on. Yeah. So again, these are my five steps to treating your room and getting it to translate my home studio treatment framework. Follow the steps. Make sure you get the most out of your room and speaker. Just download it at the link in the description. So talking about speaker directivity and how it affects treatment, Let's start off with a very basic rule of thumb, right? And that is that the better matched the directivity is to the exact room shape, the less that room gets excited, the less the response of the room is going to interfere with your speakers, aka the more speaker you're going to hear, and therefore the better the translation, the mixed translation should be. Yeah. Sound system designers have really taken this to kind of its peak level at the moment. Yeah, if you want to find out more about that, if you want to get that, go down that rabbit hole, check out Merlin Van Veen and his YouTube channel, his website, his Facebook page is actually pretty good. Um, I'll put a link to all of that in the description. But basically, the idea is simple, right? You want to put the sound where it needs to be and not where it shouldn't be, aka the room, the surfaces of the room. Yeah. And obviously in large venues, we're talking concert halls or that sort of thing. We're talking the crowd, put the music, put the sound where the crowd is. And you could kind of say, well, in a studio, that would mean just put the sound where the listening position is. Now, typically in kind of mid and high frequencies, this is done through controlled interference patterns and also waveguides. Yeah? And so that's why in, in concert venues, in big sound systems, you see these line arrays, that's why they look the way they do, yeah, because that's how the drivers are arranged in a way to control lateral dispersion together with the waveguides built into each of those little speakers. Well, they're not actually that little. Um, and then in the kind of bass, this also works through interference, but that usually means that you need a, a lot of space with a lot of subs and uh, that way you can control the directivity and you, do, you can do some sort of beam forming with the low frequencies. Now, how well does this work? In big venues, this works pretty well, yeah? Um, with limits, obviously, because the speaker or the sound from the speaker won't just stay exactly where you place it, aka the crowd in this, in this case, and then just abruptly end sort of when, uh, when, where the walls sit of the venue. Yeah, so there are limits to this. Uh, but it works surprisingly well. And uh, in fact, I mean, if you just think about, for example, a, a train station, a big train station, and uh, maybe in, in like old movies when they play the announcements in the background and the whole building just kind of echoes in 
in speech, yeah? Compare that to what we do nowadays where each platform has very directed, narrow directivity speakers that focus the sound on just the one platform, often even just one side, yeah? And that way the, 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 the space is less excited, a lot less sound goes where it shouldn't go, AKA the, the big space and just stays where the people are on the platform. Yeah, so that's kind of the extreme example. The only thing is that it needs to be designed properly and the design process is definitely a skill that needs to be learned. It's not that easy to do. And in most venues, um, they would definitely still profit from some acoustic treatment. Usually it's about just reducing the reverb time, the overall reverb time for Spectrum. Um, to get uh, higher speech intelligibility in the most cases. Now for studio monitors, the philosophy so far has really been to keep the dispersion, the directivity as wide as possible and as even as possible. Yeah, so basically that the, the, the directivity doesn't have any sudden jumps as we go from high to low frequencies. And this is largely based on experience from listening tests, results from listening tests, um, where the, the speakers with this kind of wide, even dispersion are usually rated best, probably because we simply like to hear full range lateral reflections. Yeah, it's as simple as that. But that's kind of where this kind of starts breaking apart for me, because as so often kind of extrapolating requirements for a studio where the goal is mixed translation, yeah, so extrapolating those results uh, to that from just listening tests, which just rate enjoyment more than anything, that's kind of where the problem lies for me, yeah, because those two are not the same thing. And simply because you enjoy listening to a sound system does not necessarily mean that it's great for a mixed translation. And from my experience in home studios, there's no doubt that at least controlling lateral reflections leads to more detail in the stereo image, which leads to obviously um, better detail in terms of panning or easier panning, more precise panning, but it also affects how we hear the space between and behind the speakers, so front to back. All these things are drastically improved by controlling so kind of absorbing or at least breaking up lateral flexions when we're talking about a home studio. So that would suggest that a speaker with a controlled narrow directivity would lead to the same result, right? So less energy played into the room, less interference from the response of the room. So you're hearing more speaker and so you get better mixed translation. And that would obviously also mean that you just need less treatment to get to that result. And that should, by the way, be largely the same for controlled mid-bass, um, cardioid mid-bass, just controlled directivity uh, in, the, in the low frequencies for the same reason, right? You're, you're playing less energy into the room surfaces, so the response from the room is going to be less. So we're talking less energy into standing waves and especially with this kind of cardioid base pattern, potentially uh, reducing the chance of speaker boundary interference. Now I have to say honestly that I, at this point, haven't worked directly with a speaker system like that. So I'm, I can't speak from firsthand experience, but I would assume that you can't get the same amount of room reduction simply through speaker directivity, controlled speaker directivity. I would assume that the, um, well, from what I know about how this works, you can't get rid of the room completely just through controlled directivity. And so the room response is still gonna be there. It's gonna be less than with a wide dispersion speaker, but it's still gonna be there. And um, it's not gonna be nearly as well controlled as with a proper st treatment strategy. So especially in the low end, my kind of gut tells me that you'd probably still need some treatment. And considering how difficult it is actually to control the low end decay in a small room and how much treatment that needs, you probably still need more bass traps, bass trapping than you would 
assume than you would think, unfortunately. So does a kind of controlled narrow di directivity have different requirements than a less controlled directivity speaker? Probably yes, all things being equal, you'll probably hear less room and aka more speaker with this kind of speaker than with a standard Y dispersion speaker, which should help with mixed translation. And also you should be able to get away with less putting less effort into controlling reflections. You'll probably also get away with controlling or less need for low end control, low end absorption. But again, considering how much it takes to actually do that, you probably will benefit from some treatment and my gut kind of tells me that it's probably more than you'd think. All right, so I hope that answers this question in particular, if you've been thinking about this as well, yeah? But with that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.